Okay, I'm going to start the recording. All right, uh, thank you all so much for coming today to our monthly children and youth services meetup. It's actually been a while since we've had one of these, just with travel and, and holidays and everything. Um, so I don't think we've had one since April. <laughs> uh, but today we're going to be talking about parent and family engagement. And for those of you who don't know what this series is, CYS stands for Children and Youth Services. This is just a monthly informal meetup for anyone who works with children and youth um, to come and chat and ask questions and discuss stuff. Uh, so anyone is welcome. Um, we do have a topic that is chosen each time, but it is not prescriptive. We can always move the discussion wherever we want it to go, and you're always welcome to bring additional comments, questions, or other topics that you'd like to discuss. <clears throat> Uh, this is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube. And if any of you are interested in OPI credit, um, you can email Cole Barto and she can get that arranged for you. But for, for all of our trainings, OPI credit is available, but that's only available if you attend live. Um, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> Okay, so a few things before we get into the discussion. I did want to uh, bring your attention to a few things. So one, in MSL Learn, which is the Moodle space for the State Library, there is a new course available. It's called the Youth Services Overview course. And so it's entirely self-paced. It's about, it, it gives you one hour of CE credit in library services to the public. And it's just sort of like, mile wide inch deep broad overview of youth services at the library. If you have a new youth services person, if you have a volunteer or even a trustee, someone who's maybe curious about youth services and generally what it's like. Um, we I designed this with I worked with other state library folks in Indiana, um, Tennessee, and uh, Michigan, and we designed this course as a great orientation document. So none of none of the information in here is presented as prescriptive. It just gives a lot of different options for how you can approach youth services, things to be aware of and things to consider um, that are, I think, especially helpful for someone who might be new to the library world or new to library services to youth um, for them to consider. So <clears throat> feel free to check that out. You can enroll directly yourself into the course. And eventually there will be three accompanying courses that will focus on specific age groups. So there will be a an early literacy, early childhood course, um, a school aged course, and then a teen services course. <clears throat> so I will announce when those are ready, but currently this is just a, a big broad overview view of youth services in general. Um, additionally, uh, so we just wrapped the Microsoft Word tech cohort um, that was also conducted through MSL Learn. And so we're going to be starting a new tech cohort, this time on Microsoft Excel. So if you're interested in participating in that, that will also be entirely self-paced. We are having a kickoff webinar on July 24th at 2 p.m. So you're welcome to attend that, and that will give you all the information on how the co cohort is run, what materials we're using for the course, um, how you can get your technology credit, um, and just the general format. So our goal for that kickoff webinar is for you to have all the information to decide if you'd like to participate or not. And you're welcome to ask questions, uh, reach out to me and, and let me know if you'd like more information. <clears throat> The tech cohort class is available in MSL Learn. You can go ahead and enroll yourself if you like, um, and then find out more information on the 24th. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, additionally, we also have an upcoming uh, cohort opportunity starting in probably the fall. Um, if you're interested in food programming in libraries, we had an introduction to food programming uh, webinar back in May, and we're going to be working with that presenter, Rebecca, uh, with a small group of libraries to do deeper learning and to give libraries an opportunity to really think about 
how they might want food programming to look at their libraries and to create a plan to implement food programming at their libraries. So we're looking for a small group of libraries to work with. Um, there's going to be a series of virtual workshops with Rebecca, time to plan, time to think, do outreach, make connections, all of that. So if you're interested in that opportunity, please let me know. Um, I think we're hoping to select the cohort participants by the end of the summer. Another reminder that the MSL trunk program is available for people to use. Uh, we have, uh, I think, seven trunks available now. Uh, we recently just added two more as part of the solar eclipse activities for libraries STEM program. Um, so <laughs> the solar eclipse activities for libraries. The acronym is SEAL. Uh, so those are called the SEAL STEM trunks. And there's one that's called the SEAL STEM Sunspotter trunk. And then there's another one that's called the SEAL STEM Telescope trunk. And um, these trunks are focused on solar viewing and helping patrons understand how solar eclipses happen. Because we're having two solar eclipses in uh, October 2023 and April 2024. Montana is not in the path of totality, but it will still look pretty dramatic here. Um, and um, it is unique in that the path of totality is going across um, the United States, which does not happen uh, very often. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in space science and uh, you want to help your patrons learn more about eclipses so that they can better enjoy the upcoming ones, you can check those trunks out. There's another training coming up in November, the Reimagining School Readiness Training, and this is really great for anyone who works with young children and families. This is specifically aimed for how to better give children the tools and the skills to um, approach learning and approach life with um, resilience and excitement. Uh, so school readiness is kind of referring to this um, developmental process between ages zero and eight. Uh, so if you're interested in incorporating more school readiness stuff in your early childhood, early literacy programming, feel free to attend that. Um, anyone is welcome, you know, librarians, trustees, um, and you'll get a little package of free stuff, which is which is quite cool. And those are going to be um, virtual workshops. It's a three part series um, in November. Uh, a few more announcements. Uh, there is going to be a teen services, um, a couple of teen services sessions at fall workshops in September in Great Falls. One of them is focused on connected learning that will be led by Dusty Deans and Catherine Murphy, two frontline librarians. And then there's going to be another workshop on um, doing poetry with teens um, and specifically with the Poetry Out Loud co competition. Uh, so Monica Grable from the Mon Montana Arts Council will be coming and giving that presentation. So if you're interested in working with teens, if you're interested in doing more with poetry in teens, um, come to either of those workshops um, and we'd love to see you there. And then lastly, we just did a reprint of our ready to read brochures. And so we have a lot of them and I'd like to give them away. So if you're interested in getting a package of the babies, toddlers, preschoolers brochures to hand out to your patrons, uh, we also have bookmarks. We have those large cards that say read, write, talk, sing, play. And then also the magnets that say read, write, talk, sing, play. So um, I will drop a bunch of links into the chat once we are starting with the discussion um, and you're welcome to sign up for any of these things or just let me know if you have any questions. <clears throat> okay, uh, I will pause and see, Sam, did you have any questions about any of that? That was a long time of me just talking. Uh, no, that was uh, pretty clear and straightforward. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right, so now we'll go and get ahead and get started on parent and family engagement. I do have a couple of questions here, and I do have a couple of resources that I wanted to share. Um, but just some starting points to to start talking. Um, 
how have you most successfully engaged parents and caregivers and families at your library? Um, what has worked surprisingly or not surprisingly? Um, what has not worked as well? Uh, I'm curious to know, my impression is that uh, a lot of parent and caregiver support is aimed at, you know, children with young children and fa their families. But I'm also curious to know if teen parents of teens um, might have questions or want support. <laughs> uh, so kind of curious about that. Um, what sorts of questions do you notice that parents or caregivers have? Um, what do you wish that you could do more of? And then at the end, um, you know, deciding the next topic for next month's meetup. Um, so I'll mute myself. Feel free to consider. I'll go ahead and stick some things in the chat and then uh, we can pick up again. Okay, I finished putting things into the chat. So feel free to take a look at that. That has the Reimagining School Readiness application, the trunk program request form, and the ready to read package request. So if you would like any of those things, feel free to, to click on those. Um, but back to the discussion. Um, yeah, Sam, since you're the only person here live today, uh, do you have any questions about parent family engagement? Is that something you're looking to do more of? Is that something that you know, the parents and caregivers in your community are asking for? Well, sure. We're always looking to uh, try and uh, reach as many uh, uh, young adults and kids as possible. <laughs> um, mainly the, uh, uh, oh, the out, or, oh, the request we've had from uh, caregivers and parents uh, generally just as a, uh, uh, mainly pertains to trying to find books that their uh, their kids are uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some um, that uh, oh, really enjoy our uh, oh, computers that we've set aside just for kids that don't have internet access mm -hmm. that they can get to, but have plenty of educational games. Uh, we try a variety of uh, programs for uh, kids and young adults. Um, our summer reading program, which we're doing now, is uh, off to a good start. Yay! <laughs> um, but I, I guess the main concern that I've heard from uh, uh, parents and caregivers is just trying to get their, uh, their kids interested in reading. Mm. Yes, and there's always, um, I mean, kind of going along with summer reading, there's always this interesting discussion regarding, I guess, motivation, like how, how do you kind of spark that interest and, um, you know, because ideally, in an, I think in an ideal world, you know, you don't need to have external motivation in order for people to, to especially young children, to read or to learn or whatever. There's just something that you find that's really interesting to them, and um, they can sort of help participate and direct their learning. Um, 
that's always a hard question to answer too because it's also always so person dependent um mm. you know even young children you know they're still sort of discovering what they like what they enjoy but there's still stuff that they know oh i don't <laughs> enjoy this i don't like this or or you know so um i think there are certain things that i think um tend to be you know popular but it, it's 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 hard to know exactly unless you really talk with uh, a kid and and see um i will say that um you know sometimes people have had a little bit more success um with kind of process-based activities rather than outcome-based activities and by that i mean you know, for example, you're doing a craft or you're doing um, some sort of activity. And instead of being like, okay, today we're making this owl and this is here are all the parts and this is what it looks like and this is what you're making. Um, I think it's sometimes for some children, it's it's more fun for them to say, okay, we're doing a craft today and we're focusing on um, this technique, for example, maybe finger painting or um, like cutting out paper in different shapes, um, but then they can decide how how they want it to look. And they're more sort of like, this is how you um, this is how you do the technique, but then however you apply the technique to create whatever you want is up to you. Um, I think something I have heard from some librarians is um you know especially with sort of the informal learning environment that a library is so great at providing um it can be a really great opportunity for like quality time between um parents and their children but sometimes people have noticed that parents can be overly prescriptive in what the kids are doing with crafts or with something especially if there's like a model um sometimes people will hear a parent being like, oh no, that's not supposed to go there. You're supposed to put it here or you're supposed to do it this way. Or in some extreme cases, the parent taking over and doing the thing for the kid. Um, so I think sometimes if you can structure things where um, you're kind of experimenting, like you've learned how to do something, but then you can also experiment with it. Um, that frees up any expectation of this is how it's supposed to look and this is how you're supposed to do it and can help people both kids and adults exercise the sort of exploration and creativity and you know trying things out and seeing what works um that sort of stuff so that is something i've heard from some libraries where you know not that you have to do that all the time but it, i think um kind of switching it up between those things can can help um with with those sorts of interactions um so i don't know if that helps to answer your question but i think a lot of people do find um with activities where there's sometimes an iterative process of like there's not this product is your end goal but like you're meant to try things out and see how it works um i think that can be really intriguing for for some people um and can be really interesting and let me show you <coughs> um there's actually a really great so the reimagining school readiness training that i was talking about earlier um they have a really great um resource uh database of activities that are hands-on and very much focused on this kind of process-based learning. Um, so let me share my screen again. Um, so here I'm on the Reimagining a School Readiness Toolkit website, <laughs> and you can see in their activity database, um, uh, for example, let's maybe look at the cardboard challenge. So 
So using cardboard boxes of different shapes and sizes, construct a unique or new creation and then make up a narrative to go along with it. Um, so, you know, they can make a monster, they can make a house, and then they have to create a story to go along with it. Um, and, you know, these kinds of things can automatically help people with like, you know, having interesting questions to think about, like, what are you trying to make? Um, how are you trying to make it? Uh, what's the story behind this? And and can really help get people ex excited about it. Um, so, yeah, I can send you this. I can stick this in the chat as well. Um, if you'd like to take a look at some of these. Yeah, thank you very much for the links. I'm <coughs> especially excited about looking into the uh, oh the trunk uh, regarding the eclipses. Yeah, those are really really fun. Um, I mean, uh, we had so we had some trainings with the Space Science Institute, and they're the ones who created these trunks and sent them to state libraries all across the country, and. Um, yeah, it was great because, you know, I like I'm sort of like, yeah, if someone came up to me and asked me, how does an eclipse work? I would have been like, oh, yeah, it's when the moon blocks the sun for a solar eclipse. And that <laughs> that that was like about it. <laughs> um, but the the training and the activities in the trunk, they 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 talked about how to use them all. And then just understanding more. They had great questions like, well, you know, the the moon is revolving around the Earth and like ostensibly moving in front of the sun every month so why don't we have a solar eclipse every month and we were like that's a really good question we don't know why <laughs> <laughs> um and so they were explaining all of that and it, it was it was like oh yeah all these things and then just also thinking about space and how vast it is and how cool it is and learning about all of that was was really great so um you know i think a lot of people know generally how solar eclipses work but there's so many other parts about it that can be really interesting to to think about and 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 know and the cool thing <coughs> excuse me is that both trunks have solar viewing equipment um so you're you're meant to observe the sun safely mm -hmm. so remember no one is supposed to look directly at the sun that's bad um but with these you know the telescope and there's like a a sort of mini sun spotter thing um, you can look at the sun and, and see the the cool things happening on the sun surface um, so yeah would highly recommend checking those out um, <coughs> excuse me I am currently doing a website sort of revamp um, so th eventually there will be like specific web pages on here's what's in the seal stem trunk um, I'm hoping by like end of this month, maybe early next month, um, but that's not quite available publicly yet. But you can also just reach out to me and, and ask questions. But um, yeah, I'm still still working on that. <clears throat> um, one other resource that I wanted to share, um, well, a couple others. So there's this uh, resource called Vroom, vroom.org. And this is really great for providing kind of easy everyday tips directly to parents and caregivers for things that they can do with their children in daily life. Um, you know, parents and caregivers are children's first and best teachers. They're trusted by their children. They're loved by their children. and um, you know, they can really do a lot to help their kids be curious about the world, um, help them ask questions, help them sort of reason through things. And um, there's all these small things that they can do to sort of help with that. And so Vroom is something that they can sign up for. You can get texts um, directly to your phone on, I think, like a weekly basis. And it can just share, you know, Here's how you can help your children with um, counting skills, or you know, helping them with letter recognition, or 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 that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, if you notice there's someone who's like, oh, I'm I I want to sort of 
help my kid with just learning or something, this might be a great resource for that. Um, and it kind of covers like all sorts of things. And at its core, it's, it's about, you know, you don't need any fancy like tablets with like fancy videos or anything like that. The, the core of this truly is you're spending quality time with your child, you're engaging them in conversation, you're asking them questions, they're asking you questions, and they're learning from you. And that's kind of the, the core of the tips here. So it's really great. Um, <clears throat> additionally, <coughs> um, the State Library, as part of our Ready to Read Early Literacy Initiative, we have our texting program. So here I'm on the Lifelong Learning page. And so we it's similar to Vroom in that it sends you texts directly to your cell phone. Um, but this is specifically for early literacy. And um, so again, this gives free, easy tips for um, any adult with a young child in their life um, to help them learn more and um you know see and recognize all the print around them and giving them rich background knowledge about the world um and so they have all the tools needed to get ready to read when they go off to school um so you can always refer people to this as well and it's free and um a lot of people have said it's been really great for them yeah, I would add that uh, uh, we've been trying this out and recently started recommending it to our patrons. Uh, oh, great. Uh, I get the texts myself. <laughs> oh, great. No Perfect. Yeah. Exactly how it work, but uh, they're great tips. Yeah. And they're um, very like easy. Again, you don't need any fancy equipment or anything like that. Sometimes it's even just a fun question to ask your kid today. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but yeah, you're always welcome to recommend this to anybody and they can sign up. Um, and then also, I mean, this is aimed at Montana folks, but you can let people know they're welcome to share it with whomever. <laughs> I think you just need a cell phone. <clears throat> um, oh, I guess I should mention for this, um, I am talking with the, the provider that gives us these tips and I think that they're changing the number. I think the people who are currently enrolled will automatically be rolled over um, so they don't have to worry about it but eventually the number for signing up is it's currently this number but i think eventually it's going to change to a 1-800 number um, so i'm hoping by the end of the summer i can update everything let people know um, and then um, people can sign up with a new number Um, any other questions about this topic? Any other things that have worked really well for your library? Well, I would have to say that uh, we uh, did several years ago have to uh, talk to parents uh, about engaging with their kids during programs. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, yeah. I'm sure other libraries have seen it too, where the parents kind of uh, just expect to drop Plop the their kids, kid head to the back go, go yeah. on their phone yeah <laughs> uh but we haven't had any problems in the past few years uh, which has been very nice yeah and you know sometimes some of that is truly just like cyclical and you know you can't really fault an adult if they're just like this is the one time where i get to like veg out on my phone and you're sort of like okay you know what <laughs> That's that's fine. Um, but for, you know, for anyone who's watching the recording, if this is something that you do struggle with, like in your story time programs or in any of your programs where you, you want the adults to be more involved, just know that it's going to be a gradual process over time. Cultural shifts in general don't happen like this. It's about setting expectations and being consistent and then sort of letting people know and sort of inviting them into that space as well. So for example, in the context of story time, um, if you have a bunch of adults in the room who are not involved, it's unrealistic to expect them to be involved the entire story time. So I think suggestions that I've seen is just asking the parents explicitly, hey, in the beginning, like doing your welcome, saying like, we're so glad you're here. A parents and adults in the room, if you could just put your phones down, put your eyes up here, and then we can do our introduction song together. Um, that would be really great. 
Um, so you could start with something small where you say, hey, adults in the room, we want you to participate in this one event. Um, and this is why it's important. And I mean, you still might have parents who, who are like, no, I'm not going to do that. And that's OK. But at least you're creating that space for them. And you're also kind of letting them know that this is the expectation. And if you start doing that every time in story time, um, I think people kind of will understand, oh, this is the new how this is the new how we do it. <laughs> um, and so you can start off with like the intro song or whatever, and then gradually put in more activities and and then you can sort of you can also explicitly say that we're looking for more adult engagement you know we want you to know these songs we want you to know these finger plays so that you can do this at home with your children they're practicing these skills and if you do this at home with them that even further cements these things um so just sort of starting off small <laughs> and knowing that it's going to be a gradual shift over time and then also, you know, you're always going to get a new crop of, of children and adults, and you can sort of establish expectations um, from the get-go with them. Um, and over time, uh, you, can, you can change uh, the expectations for programming. Any other comments on this? <laughs> so, excuse me. Okay, if there isn't anything else, um, I am going to go ahead and stop. But before we end for today, uh, Sam, you get to choose the topic for next month's meetup. Is there anything related to children and youth services that you'd like to have addressed? Yeah, I've uh, always been curious uh, about other libraries' approaches to uh, uh, outreach, like in schools or uh, with uh, other organizations, uh, whether they're uh civic uh, type of organizations yeah okay we can definitely do that so um outreach and partnerships i guess sure uh for example like uh we have a uh, a weekly uh market here in anaconda mm -hmm. and the uh, friends of the library often have a book stall but uh that's uh, as far as we go with engagement uh, with that program, I wasn't sure if anybody else had uh, had experience becoming more involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, that's a great topic. All right, done. That is the July Children and Youth Services uh, meetup topic. Um, Okay, I will go ahead and stop the recording here. This will be available on our YouTube channel, hopefully later today. Um, but please do reach out if you have any questions about anything covered in this. Um, and again, anyone is welcome to our Children and New Services meetups, and you can bring whatever questions or topics you would like. So let me stop the recording here.